Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello, welcome to Asia Tech Podcast number 18. This is part two of a two part series talking about autonomous vehicles in Asia. This week, we're talking about legislation and the key players in AV. Who will lead the autonomous market by 2020? Asia Tech Podcast, voice of the Asian tech ecosystem. ecosystem. So what, where do we want to start this week? I mean, we talked a lot about autonomous vehicles last week, and I really feel like we only kind of got a third of the way in, maybe half of the way in. Mm-hmm. But we should continue, I think, to talk about that. Yeah. 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 Quick review. What did we talk about last week? Well, I mean, you know, we, I think the main thing or one of the main things that I wanted to get out there was just the fact that autonomous vehicles in the same way that a smartphone kind of changed like your entire day-to-day life hmm. is that this is going to have the same type of impact. And we kind of talked about, at least in my mind, what would a typical day or what could a typical day for an autonomous vehicle be and for the owner of that autonomous vehicle? And what were the, some, what were some of the opportunities that arose because of that? Mm-hmm. Right. And I think today I want to talk about what I'll consider. And we talked a little bit about some of the ancillary benefits or effects, because I don't think they're all going to be benefits of that. And, you know, some of them included, you know, land prices, shopping, parking, right? how all those things would be impacted, but also employment. Right. I think we spent a little bit of time talking about how one of the largest employers in the United States and probably globally are truckers, right? So people driving mm-hmm. trucks and how really what they're doing is just going from point to point and that can probably be automated. You know, right, what, right now, Michael, I need an autonomous vehicle to take me to Yokohama this weekend to drop me off at this race. Because you know what? The thing I've discovered about parking lots in Yokohama is that they don't exist and or, right, check this out. And th- this is like, you know, you re- it really rams home the point about the benefits here. The uh, Most parking lots in Yokohama have a height restriction of about 1 meter 50. And I don't know what kind of cars they make that are under 1 meter 50. Ours is like 170. <laughs> so what do you drive? Around, yeah, we looked around all the parking lots. And you, we can't get in anywhere because the only cars that they have are <laughs> under 1 meter 50 or they're like... Less than one meter ninety or whatever. Oh wait a second! Are these one of those tower parking places? Yeah, all, all different kinds, or just like one-off parking lots. You know, like people right, are running right, right. out there. There's a small slither of the sidewalk, right? But it's a real problem here. I mean, if I had an autonomous vehicle, wow, fantastic! Right. I mean, I, I had the same problem when I lived in Japan, right? Because I had an SUV, and it was just oh, too tall, and it wasn't that big, right? It just wasn't that big, but yeah, we got shut out of a bunch of parking spaces, and it was. Re- and, and frankly, we got shut out of a bunch of like parking lots, not even just the auto park places where you had to put your car like in a box and it rotated around on a machine. Right. I even think Tokyo Midtown at one point wouldn't allow you to drive at least my car into the parking lot there, if I remember correctly. Anyway, but yeah, a, an autonomous vehicle would come in super handy, right? Right. But anyway, so while, while you're running your race, I guess you're running the race this weekend, yeah? Yeah, right. So I need wow. to take the bike there and everything. So it's just it's just an amazing logistical challenge. I use the <laughs> word challenge to be as positive as possible. But you <laughs> like realize, that, wow. yeah, go ahead, no, go ahead. You realize you know, you've lived in Tokyo. I mean, you know how how tough it is, but you realize like the parking lots are you know it's a big issue here. You would have thought. I mean, if you went anywhere in the world, you could have thought you could just rock up to a parking lot and park. But here in Tokyo, you can't just go to a parking lot and park. You've got to be under the height of the maximum height of the parking lot, right? I don't know what kind of, what kind of cars are under 1 meter 50. I don't, I don't know. Somebody help me out. What are they making? Like some Wait, DeLorean or something? 50? That's yeah. really like, – even I'm taller than 1 meter 50. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, you, and you know I'm not that tall. So. <laughs> right, so that's one problem that hopefully this will solve, right? But it's tangible yeah, I mean, right here right now. There are. We talked a little bit about traffic and pollution, right? We talked about yeah. safety in the sense that, um, you know, humans are the main cause of most crashes. Yeah. That was a big thing, wasn't it? Reducing crashes by 90%. That was the McKinsey data from last week. Yeah, it sure was. I mean, it's phenomenal. But, that's the case. Yeah. I mean, we should also, I think we should touch a little bit on the regulatory environment. Yeah. What do you think? 
Well, that's the the slowest moving part of the whole equation, really, isn't it? And that right. And isn't this isn't this one of the reasons why we think that the likelihood of autonomous vehicles becoming more prevalent is well more likely to happen outside the United States than inside the United States? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Right. I mean, can you talk a little bit about what it's like in Europe? I I I can talk a little bit about the U.S., but then I really want to focus on on obviously on Asia and Southeast Asia because that's where we are, right? Right. Well, I mean, in Europe, you're looking at where the big auto manufacturers are when it comes to autonomy, and the the leaders are brands like BMW. But when it comes to actually testing, it's a different thing entirely. I mean, if you you know, I can't really speak you know a lot about individual examples in Europe, but look at what's going on in Asia, and I think, for example, you find you know, leading lights of light hands regulation places like singapore really you know they they stand out as the places where autonomous vehicles are really going to push ahead right because of the way the government approaches i mean it's it's completely refreshing to how it's been dealt with all over the world where you know i think there's a whole bunch of legal issues there's you know a lot of vested interest involved but singapore seems to have got it right right i mean interestingly enough right two countries where in this region where there's not a lot of car production, if any, right? Mm. So Australia and Singapore are both kind of at the forefront of saying, we know autonomous vehicles are coming and we're going to write legislation or adapt legislation that we already have to make sure that um, that we're at the forefront of development of this autonomous um, revolution. You look at the RTA, right, mm. in um, in Singapore and the LTA, right? So the Land Transport Authority. And then you look at them saying, we want to have autonomous vehicles being tested on real roads with, you know, real traffic around them in places maybe where traffic is not as dense as it is in some other parts of the city state. But I, what, where is it? In one north? So in one north, it's a, just a regular section of Singapore. They're going to allow autonomous vehicles to be tested there mm. under certain conditions. And what it's going to mean, and I said this actually over a year ago when someone said to me, how soon do you think we're going to have autonomous cars on the road? And I said, three to five years. And they said, you're insane. But the reality is that regulations like this will beat regulations like they have in California. I think something like 13 states in the United States of America have at least put some regulations in place for autonomous vehicles, and they're well more egregious than they are. In, in Southeast Asia, right? I mean, you saw Uber was testing where? In California, Pittsburgh, and then they moved to Arizona because, mm. you know, less people, less regulated, and more likely to allow this to happen. But yeah, out here, Singapore has dedicated a lot of resources to putting the right regulations in place at every level of government to make sure that this happens, right? Mm. And the automotive sort of transportation business in Singapore has always been highly, I don't want to say controlled necessarily, but they want to make it as effective as possible, right? So they have zones inside of Singapore where you have to pay like a pretty decent amount of money to get your car into that zone. There are also heavy taxes on automobiles in Singapore. So there's like a 200%, 300% import tax, right? Sure. And so you can buy like a, what is it, a Honda, what's the what's the name of their sort of minivan thing? But you can buy a, that Honda in Japan probably for... Honda Freed five, or something? It's 5 million yen, so $50,000. And in Singapore, it's 100 to 125,000. It's really expensive. And you have to have, you have to have almost like a taxi medallion type of thing. You have to yeah. buy a license to be able to have a car. What's that going to do to autonomous vehicles? Because individuals aren't going to import them at those prices, right? No, they're not. And again, I think this gets back to something we always talk about. What's going to happen is that whole concept is going to be professionalized, right? Mm. So in the same way that there's there's the potential for Airbnb and we talked about Metro Spaces and all those companies to professionalize the sort of sharing part of lending out something that you own, I think the same thing's going to happen to autonomous vehicles. Mm. So you'll see a lot of people, you know, buy 5, 10, 15 cars, put them on the road autonomous. Um, comply with all the local regulations. And that will happen both in Singapore and in Australia as well. And what it's going to mean is that individuals will not own cars. I mean, more and more, they're just not going to own them because of all the all the things that uh, all the things that we've already talked about, right? The scenario you talked about last week, Michael, it sort of raises the prospect that 
people could buy or part own an autonomous vehicle or even crowdfund one and and have it as a an income producing asset right because it could travel around the city performing its duty and picking people up and earning money whether that's for you know for uber or for some other service and it could produce you an asset in the same way that you could do with airbnb or you could invest in real estate property right rather than a, a car being a, a liability as it sits on your driveway 95 percent of the time right and i think when i think you bring up a great point actually and that is when most people think about what the money making or the income earning potential is for an autonomous vehicle, they're thinking replacing a taxi, mm. right? In other words, I wake up in the morning and I want to go to work. So instead of having a car, right, I will use somebody else's car that's autonomous and it'll take me to my office. And yet I think there are so many other, and this is the, one of the reasons why I think it's such a large issue, is because I think there's so many other ways for this to be monetized, but also just to provide services. Think about this. If you're driving your car over a well-known route every single day, right, autonomously, so that car is being driven, what is it doing? Well, it's gathering data, right? It's gathering road data, potentially, so you could put sensors in the road, and that car traversing the same sort of track every day can then tell the government road authority, right, or the land transportation authority in Singapore, this road is going to need to be repaved because these cars have gone over those roads for a certain amount of mileage, right? So this is one of the gigantic benefits that no one's talking about. And, so, and then it says, wait a second, if we're gathering all this data on it, well, then can we use artificial intelligence and, you know, machine learning to figure out how often those roads are traversed. And then and it gets really meta, right? Then if you're a business and you can understand or have access to that data, so someone sells that data to you, you can understand better placement for your stores, for a school, for bus stops, for all of these things that haven't been considered before because you didn't have enough data or information mm -hmm. to be able to figure out to do that, right? So then now you've already introduced two or three new businesses just in a small location, right? How, who's going to gather the data? Most likely, if, if we're lucky, well, lucky or not, the governments will gather them, right? Hopefully, and be able to share those data at reasonable prices to a whole bunch of other players, but also mapping services, right? You already see Google having this sort of 360 and human view mapping services, right? And that's just going to continue. In the old days, Google would have to have its own cars and Apple would have to have its own cars to go out and record the street view and to record the routes and the roads. But now if there are autonomous vehicles on the road, that's just going to happen all day, every day. Right. It's like right? distributed more, computing, isn't it? Exactly. So, And that's another great point, which we did not talk about last week. right? So imagine you're driving your car around, I don't know, pick a place, Korea or Indonesia or Jakarta, right? and you're gathering map data, and um, you're understanding all the things that are happening around that. Right? So then you have other ways to make money. Let's say you want to have a meeting in your car. So now you're disintermediating potentially office space mm -hmm. as well because you can build vehicles, right? People, again, are just thinking – they're looking backwards as opposed to looking forwards. Your automobile does not have to be in the same shape or size or scope that exists today, right? So you don't have to have a four-seater sedan. You can have literally a table with internet access – Mm. television screens. We talked about it last week, right? If you have the windows in the car, it can be display mechanisms for everything. It can all be wireless. And now you have a mobile office. And that means that the hour that you take to go from wherever you are to the airport or whatever trip, let's say you're going from someplace in Singapore to someplace in Malaysia and you're driving. So now instead of being on an airplane, you can have two hours of incredible productivity with five or six people. That in itself can be like a new service. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Right. <laughs> right. So you could go somewhere and you could be productive in that time. And the option has always been take the plane, take the train or drive, right? 
driving, <laughs> you're fully committed. You can't do anything. It's, it's dead time. Taking the train, possibly, but you know, it's not as it's not as good as experience. But if you were to take this autonomous vehicle, it just took you there. You could use that time. In theory, you could live in that thing, right? Is that possible? Could you just sort of be driving around? Not stopping anywhere, twenty four hours, maybe parking up for a little bit to rest, and you you wouldn't have to pay any tax, like a you know like any uh, property related right. tax. You could live in a, a car and just be driven round. You could, but you know you could also have a mobile hospital in there, so you could provide those types of services, right? Because think about we already talked a lot in our last episode about how this would help traffic problems, but that's going to take time. But one of the biggest issues, whether it's in Jakarta, in Manila, in Bangkok, is that if you have an emergency medical problem and you're in an ambulance, you could die in the ambulance because of yeah. the traffic problems. But if you could build a machine that is completely connected, right, and is purpose-built to pick you up if you have a problem, a health problem, and you could get served in that vehicle because yeah. it's fully electrified, fully connected, um, has enough room for people to stand or just pull over. You could get operated on. You could solve heart attack problems, all of these issues, right? So what happens inside that vehicle, I don't even really want to call it a car, but what happens inside that vehicle is going to completely change the way we live our day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. I think it's blatantly obvious in ways that people have not considered, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. But think about this too, right? I like to talk about the sort of second level or third level impact of what an autonomous car can have. So let's say you have three or four people sitting in a meeting in a car and you're driving from one place in Singapore to the southern part of, um, of Malaysia and you have a meeting there. But that meeting is later in the day. Well, think about the other ancillary impacts that's going to have. First of all, it's very different from a train because a train's going to be point to point and a train cannot get creative because it can't get off the rails. But that car or that vehicle can go anywhere you'd like it to go. So mm -hmm. if you get tired and have to stop somewhere, if you want to eat somewhere. So again, you can literally eat in the car in a way that you could never have eaten before. So it changes the catering business. I know it sounds insane, but it's definitely possible, right? Um, and there are people, there are businesses in the United States that are actually automating the way food is prepared in moving vehicles so that the delivery business is now changing, but you could have that delivered to your car. I know it all sounds like pie in the sky, but think about this too. If you have a two-hour drive and you're productive on that two-hour drive, when you arrive at your destination, now you have actually leisure time. No mm -hmm. one's going to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And what that means is that you now have in a new location, two hours away from where you were before, you can have a gym or a tennis court or a golf course or some other, because you're creating, you're so productive mm. and you're forced, it's almost like forced productivity when yeah, that right. trip is over. You're not going into an office now. Now you may potentially go out to lunch or you may go play a round of golf or do some kind of leisure thing. So it changes the whole leisure business as well, right? What would be the point of going to the office? That could be the least productive part of your day right <laughs> completely right it's like why why go sit in a building somewhere right when you've just had a very productive meeting and you kind of want to stretch out right and go play yeah. tennis yeah it's the what if question i mean it's dangerous isn't it but it it raises the question you know what if you didn't need an office right and you could conduct most of your activities and have productive time and not have this dead space time i mean you know if you lived in jakarta and you were stuck in a three-hour traffic jam every day. That changes the game entirely now, right? Completely. Completely. But what does it do, right? So in, in your mind, so I think it actually downsizes some of the auto production, right? Because mm. not everyone's going to need a vehicle. But, but then again, the more you think about it, maybe you need more vehicles for more of this productivity. And there will be more people moving around. And it will argue as well for more electric vehicles as opposed to gasoline and, and kind of diesel powered vehicles as well right because mm -hmm. if you have all these cars driving around all the time it's going to be really really bad for pollution in places where pollution is already bad right right well we have a lot of players a lot of vested interest obviously in the future of sure. autonomous vehicles but we also have a lot of new entrants here's the interesting thing and this sort of 
I suppose we've got to consider this in the context of regulation as well. But if you look at all the the big names who have vested interest in autonomy, autonomous vehicles, Amazon, Google, Apple, Samsung, Tesla, Uber, Baidu. I mean, all of these are billion dollar plus companies, right? I mean, the only one they that are. actually has any kind of existing vehicle production is Tesla, right? But that's a you know a relatively new player. But if you consider yeah. all of those, I mean, do they care if if people like General Motors go out of business? Probably not. Not at all. Not at all. And actually, if you remember what the Nokia comment on Apple, when Apple said, we're thinking about doing a phone, they said, and I'm not quoting per se, but getting pretty close close to it. Those PC guys aren't just going to waltz in here and build a phone. Yeah. I think it was actually the, um, no, it was the Palm Pilot guy, I think. Right. At the time, I think we said those PC guys aren't just going to waltz in here and build a phone and take over this market. It's way more complicated than that. And I think for a while, the car companies had thought the same thing, but now they're really starting to figure out maybe these PC guys, for lack of a better term, are really just going right. to waltz in here and take this thing over because it's all software, right? And they've got this, As, the right audience, right? I mean, talking about Nokia, I remember doing research on Nokia probably around about 2006, 2007. The iPhone was coming out. We started mm -hmm. talking to – we went out and interviewed teenagers. So we asked 13-year-olds about Nokia and all these different kind of brands. And, you know, right. they, they were the, the mainstay of these – Nokia brands, right? Up sure. until that point, they were the ones that got Nokia to the forefront and, you know, SMS and all that. But I can just remember one interview, a 13 year old kid, and it was just word association. And they, he said, Nokia. And he just went, meh. Not interested. <laughs> that was his response. Meh. <laughs> that just summed it up. I remember showing the Nokia execs that, and they weren't impressed. But I thought, you know, wow, maybe all your road warriors out there think that Nokia is still, you know, an important brand to them, but this generation coming through, they don't care. You know? They don't. You don't mean anything to them anymore. They're jumping on the Apple bandwagon. So, you know, do we see this kind of thing happening with Auto as well? Do they, do young people, new drivers have any kind of, you know, relationship with Ford or BMW or Volkswagen or whatever? No, they don't care. And, and all of their, all of their devices are built by so if you think about their experiences, right, like my daughter gets into an Uber, she has an iPhone, um, she uses Google Docs, right? She orders from Amazon, her friends have Samsung phones, all of these things, they use WeChat, all, all these things. So any of these companies, if they came out with an autonomous vehicle, think about it, you're online with your friends, you're chit-chatting and you're on Uber and you say, you know what, let's go, let's go downtown. So you just order a car on Uber, they don't care who makes the car or whatever, they just know it's convenient. And they're just going to wave it in. If that car actually happens to be an Apple branded car, or a Tesla branded car, or a Google branded car, they don't care, mm. right? Especially if they don't own it, right? Yeah, and that's the great thing about it too is that they're not wed to any particular brand of automobile. What's the differentiation? In a way, the automobile ends up being like a um, like a dumb pipe of the internet, right? Right, right. That's interesting, isn't it? Because it's those guys. I mean, look what Apple and Google are doing by putting these devices in your home now, right? They're right. Trying, that's the forefront of the battle, isn't it? That's where it's going to be fought out, where you're just going to say, right, I need to get to here. And Alexa then calls a the car for you, right? Yeah, exactly. So you just stand in your living room and you say to Alexa, um, I need a car in 30 minutes because I need to go to, you know, Rick's American Cafe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can't believe I said that. <laughs> um, but getting back to some of the regulatory stuff, right, and the government involvement. I mean, if you look at what the Chinese government is is talking about, right, they want to have they want to half its cars have some form yeah. of autonomy by 2020. That's not that far away. What do you think of that? I mean, that's I think it, I think right? it's I think it's definitely possible. The thing about, you know, these countries like China and India and Indonesia is that they have so many resources to throw at something and there's no sort of historical precedent for right. what we called car culture in, in our last episode, right? So nobody has a preconceived notion about the way they're supposed to use their, and I don't want to say car, but the way they're supposed to use their vehicles or automobiles, right? Mm. And as we talked about last time, 
the level of sort of coolness that's associated with that vehicle is switching to devices that you hold in your hand and other activities. So as we mentioned, right, no one's going to care about what car they get into. They're just going to care about whether it shows up on time, gets them there safely, and allows them to sort of drink and have fun and be able to go out. Mm -hmm. I really believe that that's what's going to happen. So whether, you know, regardless of how that car is branded, no one's really going to care, I think. And because the governments like in China, Australia, Singapore, in this region are really, and I'm sure that the same thing is going to happen in South Korea as well, right? And particularly with Samsung and Hyundai, these are new co- these are new companies mm. that are completely committed to making technology a part of everybody's everyday life, right? And you see these companies, um, all the car companies coming into this region. You know, Peugeot is working together with Newtonomy, mm. and they're going to start testing now in Singapore. So every part of this is going to change. And frankly, I'm guessing you've never owned a Peugeot. No. I've hired you don't one. Care. I've hired one, exactly. <laughs> that I was don't enough. care either. Yeah. <laughs> that was good enough for me. Oh, that's that was so the good. closest I ever got to sitting in one. Yeah. I think it's, I, I, you know, you, you talk about where this is going to happen and regulation is key to the rollout, isn't it? Because it's the bottleneck in all of this because the technology is there. Now we've got to make sure the legal and infrastructure framework is in place for this to happen. Will it take a, a choose my words carefully, a benign dictatorship, a planned economy? Sorry, that's the word I'm looking for. A planned top down economy like Singapore to make this happen. Because the thing about the US, there's too many vested interests, isn't there? And there's too much, mm-hmm. there's too much democracy going on. You kind of need somebody just to say, right, this is what we're doing. And then maybe that's why China or Singapore are going to make it happen first, right? I mean, how do you see that playing out compared Singapore to USA, for example? I, I think the concept of benevolent dictatorship is a really powerful one, actually. And without getting into sort of the embedded politics of what that really means, you know, sometimes you can give people too many choices. And I use the word benevolent in a way that's very strong, right? Mm. In other words... You can comment as much as you'd like about, you know, the Chinese government and people don't get to vote and there's not enough democracy. But the reality is that what's happened in China and, frankly, what's happened in Singapore, too. So you go from the smallest country to one of the largest countries and you see what a well-organized and well-intentioned government has Mm -hmm. done. And it's nothing short of incredible. So I do think it's going to take that type of regulatory situation and that type of governmental situation to push this forward. Because if you think about it, you know, the United States <clears throat> itself has, you know, all these different states and all these different entities. And, you know, one of the prob- one of the benefits of a federal republic is that what happens in Massachusetts could be different than what happens in mm-hmm. Missouri. But that's also one of the detriments of a federal republic is that the states get to make their own laws, right? And imagine being in a car in Massachusetts on your way to your cousin's wedding in Rhode Island and you have to stop the automated driving and take the wheel of a car (laughs) just because you want to get over the border into Providence, which is 30 minutes away. And I know I'm talking about maybe some geography that most people don't understand or don't, don't know about, but still it's a real situation though. It's possible. It's a real, it's a real thing. Whereas in Singapore, if you're driving around Singapore, the government's just basically said, okay, this happens in one North is, which is where we're testing it. But once we're happy that it's okay, we're rolling this out to the entire country, whether you like it or not. Oh, and by the way, we've worked together with the five largest insurance companies in the country and the implications of a crash or an accident are these. And we've already worked out what the impact is going to be both, um, from a regulatory standpoint and from a monetary standpoint, and that just is what it is. There are no factions arguing about mm. we're going to elect this lady or that guy to change the thing. There's no impact on immigration policy. And in China, the same thing. If you think about how fast the Chinese since you know since the 80s or maybe the mid 70s have electrified the entire country, interneted the entire country. Right, no one voted on this, hmm. but there's still 900 million internet users in China. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. Right, and they have the same mobile stru- mobile 
um, phone internet and, and infrastructure that we have in the United States, and it's just as fast and just as powerful, if not more so. You've got phone manufacturers there. All the things that you would want, they have, and nobody voted on it. The government just yeah. said, these are priorities for us, and this is going to happen, and the same thing's going to happen in, in the autonomous vehicle space, for sure. That's without a doubt. Well, you look at their progress that they've made in building out the rail network as well. Sure. You know, they've leapfrogged Japan in terms of producing some of the fastest trains, like the maglev train. It's just phenomenal that what they've produced, right? And the, the yeah. cost that there's been nothing spared. And now they're exporting that technology to the rest of the world, interestingly. So, yeah. you know, it takes that kind of approach to make it happen. And you, I mean, what about, what, what do you think of all those kind of localized reactions to Uber coming into different markets? Is that sort of indicative of what's going to happen with autonomous vehicles? Because I know Uber isn't the autonomous vehicle brand. But it's kind of a different prospect, but it shows what kind of factions, like you just mentioned, exist incumbent within these places. We don't hear so much about it in Asia compared to what's going on in the US or in Europe, for example. You don't, but there were there was a very um, prominent news story. I'm not making a political comment on this, but I'm just reporting what was in the Bangkok Post last week that an Uber driver, a female Uber driver in Pattaya, was chased by 20 taxi drivers and threatened because the idea is she's taking money and business away from a regular taxi driver. So you may not hear about it outside of you know, Bangkok or outside of Thailand, but the same types of things are happening in the region as well, right? We, I don't know what's happening in Malaysia because I don't read the local press there, but I know that in Thailand, according to the Bangkok Post, not according to Michael Wade's, that that thing happened last week or the week before. So there mm. is resistance to this, but what are you going to do if it's an autonomous vehicle? Right. Who are you fighting? Will they be chasing it down the street with clubs? I kinda... Could do, right. could do. Right, the same way that yeah. um, in Germany and in France, you had some of the taxi drivers flipping over the Uber cars. But in the end, right, right, you can't, you can't really take stop that progress, right? right. And so, it's very luddite, isn't it? We're going back to the industrial age with the luddites smashing the machines with sticks. Just almost the same image, right? Yeah, and again, all this stuff is cyclical, right? Yeah, all of it, and. Frankly, and I think we talked about this before as well, if I'm a sort of premier, expensive, top-level taxi driver, I love the concept of an autonomous car, mm -hmm. right? So think about why. Well, I want to take you and your wife out to like a really fancy dinner. You want to take your wife out to a really fancy dinner. You don't want to drive, Right. But you want to have a really nice experience. And the autonomous car is just not doing it for you because you want service, some other kind of service in the car. So I provide white glove tuxedo service to you. Mm -hmm. Now, the car could actually drive itself. But I'm in the car giving you service that I could never give to you if I had to pay attention to driving the car the whole time. Mm -hmm. right, so this type of kind of very high-end service is something that cannot get provided today. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people want a robot doing that, serving them champagne or some right. such thing. I think they want a human there. To, oh, I think they want to have, you know, some man or woman serving them so they can say, thank you. Right. And they can sort of commiserate with their partner and say, isn't, you know, this lady really nice for serving us or this gentleman very kind for getting us the caviar, whatever it is. We talked about a similar scenario when we talked about AI in an earlier ATP episode, didn't we? There was a, a hotel in Japan, which was all served by robots. Right. And, you know, the reaction was, is people felt it was very cold. Right. I mean, it was kind of a novelty and it's good bragging rights. You can talk about it and you can share all your content on Instagram with the robots and that. But after that, people kind of felt something was missing. You know, you're being guided to your room by this robot which is just this kind of thing with a screen on it, a smiley face, right? It's not really a robot. It's right. the same kind of concept with the autonomous car. So you've got your guy or your, the lady that comes, maybe knocks on the door, rings the doorbell, your car's ready, opens the door for you. It's that, you know, that white glove service, right? 
that yeah. would be an interesting sort of niche, right, for these people to charge a premium. Yeah, I think so. And again, that's another sort of reallocation of labor. People are very worried that automation in all cases and in all places is just going to eliminate jobs and job opportunities for humans. Mm. And we have talked about this under separate cover, but I do believe really strongly that people will adapt. They always have. And if not, maybe there won't be as many humans as there are today. Maybe you shouldn't say that. But, you know, over time, I think that that type of thing is going to happen, that people will adapt and they'll find other ways to serve other people, right? So I'm not so worried about it. I always wonder about Japan. You know, the, the fundamentals here in Japan aren't very robust when it comes to population. There's 125 million people in Japan, and they expect it to drop to, what, 85 million by 2060? So 40 million just disappear? Mm -hmm. And by 2060, I don't know what kind of percent of them, but a, a large percentage of those 85 million are going to be over 65, right? For sure. Right. So, you know... Where... And I don't want them driving. <laughs> <laughs> I think a large percent are going to be over 100, right? So Could be. Yeah. So, I mean, just think about that. Who's going to drive? I mean, where you you usually have the young immigrant workers who do these kind of jobs, right? I mean, you go anywhere in the world, you know, and you get out of the airport into a taxi, and the first person that greets you isn't from that country, right? In it's, most cases, yeah, right? In most cases. But in Japan, where are they going to come from? Are you just going to have you want to have young people? You want to have immigrants? They're going to have to have autonomous vehicles, right, to do this job. They are, and. Interestingly enough, the road structure in Japan is really going to be able to support it as well, right? So if you look at um, just the way the tolls are set up, right? What is it called? Yeah. ETC in Japan. You have a similar thing here in Thailand as well. And you're going to see, I think as well, we didn't talk about this, right? But one of the sort of ancillary things that's going to happen is that the roads are going to have sensors in them too to make that automated driving process much easier. Hmm. So the car is not going to be doing all the work. The road will be doing some work as well. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Right. So when you talk about an autonomous vehicle, it's going to be working in in um, in concert with other types of sensors, right? Mm -hmm. So, and and again, if you think about, you know, where those where those workers used to come from and where they're going to come from now, um, all those people are going to have to either get reallocated or they're just going to have to not immigrate into your. So I think it also impacts. Your immigration policy too. I mean, Japan has been a country that's had very strict immigration laws for a very long time, right? Yeah. And you're starting to see some of that play out in the rest of the world too, not just in the United States, but even in Southeast Asia. Intra-country movement is okay, or intra-region movement is okay, but you do have situations where, you know, maybe because of bad experiences or historical reasons. You're not going to have as many foreigners living in these countries as before. And to a certain extent, that's okay. What about your Bangkok taxi drivers? Are they Thai? Yeah, for the well, they're Thai and they're also from um, Burma right. and yeah, yeah. Myan Mian Myanmar. Um, yeah, so you, you see that a lot. Yeah. But, you know, the, these, these things are going to get automated out, I think, pretty quickly here as well. So. Good. So regulation, we talked about Singapore and China as interesting. These are the places to watch, aren't they? Because the, the governments are on the right side here in terms of making this happen, because it takes that kind of structure to make it happen. You know, it's got to be top Has down. To. You, you've got to have all the interest. You've got to get all the, the, the parties together and, and have that sort of, you know, that 10 year plan or whatever it is they're working off. Right. But as you go to the yeah, US, it's, it's going to be a lot harder, right? Well, it is because, again, state by state, you know, in China, the government, the central government can mandate exactly what happens. I think you'll see the same thing in Malaysia. You'll see the same thing in Indonesia. You have strong governments that are, frankly, very much looking out for their populations and in most cases doing the right thing. It gets back to the benevolence that we mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and there's very little tolerance for kind of intra-country, region to region infighting in the sense that, you know, if it's good for Java, it's good for Surabaya. Like, it's just good for the entire country. Yeah. Right? Um, and I think it's going to be very different than what's happening in parts of Europe and parts of the United States as well, because you have individual countries and individual states that are going to have different laws. And I just think the regulations there are going to be much harder. Plus, 
we didn't talk at all about how the societies and their approach to litigation, you know, my fault, your fault, mm. is just so different. Um, I've seen some spectacular, and I mean really spectacular, motorcycles into Mercedes, you know, delivery trucks or buses into Porsches, mm. accidents in Thailand. This would spark an insanely difficult fight in the United States. And in Thailand, I've seen this multiple times. People just get out of the car and go, hmm, oh, well, I guess that door needs to be replaced. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So the end of it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And they're just sitting there. They're laughing. They're talking to their cousins. They're taking photos about it. They're selfieing themselves in front of their cars. <laughs> it's just really an interesting dynamic. But because of that, you know, the way the insurance works and all those other things, I think people are just going to be much more likely to have an opinion on – where the regulations on the insurance side go that, that are going to be much easier to solve than they would be in the United States. It's just people are going to come to an agreement on this way faster than it would be in the West because that's just what they do. Right. Just what they do, right? What's your opinion on this, Michael? Because I know you've already mentioned big data and now we're talking about claims. But let's uh, take a look at what's going on in Australia. Volvo. Volvo mm -hmm. have been studying kangaroo behavior. They want to build an automated vehicle with kangaroo detection and collision avoidance yep. they want to put in their software in the cars by 2020 here's the interesting stat is 20,000 kangaroos are hit on australian roads every year cost 20,000 20,000 right every year cost costing more than 75 million dollars in claims i mean that's not a lot of claims right <laughs> but i just can imagine the lost time and just the, the sheer annoyance factor must be pretty huge didn't they make a move? Like, wasn't that wasn't that like you know the third part of Crocodile Dundee? Twenty thousand. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but you know, yeah, that's amazing to me. But yeah, again, what's the impact going to be on the insurance, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, what's my opinion on this? I think we talked about it a little bit prior. If ninety percent of accidents are caused by things that can now be controlled by software and automation, you're going to have a real big problem in the automotive insurance business. Mm -hmm. Really big problem. Do you think they would exercise, I mean, you talked about big data and making better decisions when it comes to driving and transport. Would, mm -hmm. the, would the car then say, right, okay, if we look at the data, just the patterns here, more likely to crash here, more likely to be hit by a kangaroo here, avoid, just take this route. That would then reduce accidents just by more intelligent planning, right? Just by playing the numbers. And that's really, that's what the, the, the actuaries do in insurance companies, right? And the, the car's effectively doing that for you. Right. I mean, statistically, you know, companies like Waze or technologies like Waze, right? And even in the old days, the original navigators, right? Or the GPS-based mapping systems that, you know, use real-time data, in Japan to show you traffic would always recommend a better route, right? Mm. But with the cars having sensors on them and using, as you said, big data to determine all of the other information, whether it's weather information or kangaroo information or previous accident information, high traffic, high foot traffic information, all of these things are going to go into making decisions for better um, routing or rerouting of you know cars, trucks, and any kind of autonomous vehicles. So that in of itself should make all of society way more efficient. But just it's just going to be a much more pleasant experience as well. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's I don't think there's any question that that's going to happen too. So, but the whole concept of big data, like what big data is going to do and how it's going to help, you know, the autonomous vehicles. Think about what the data would do for where you would place a cell tower. Like these are things that mm -hmm. these are like third order, second order things that no one's can, well people are considering but that most mainstream people are not discussing and that is what's going to happen to mobile data access and where do those towers need to be because if you're rerouting people from high density areas into lower density and lower traffic areas maybe there are no towers there so you have to put new towers there as well could you put a tower in a car autonomous vehicle well, well, you absolutely could, right? And that is also a really interesting idea for business. So now do the car companies, just General Motors now disintermediate Verizon or does, right. you know, or does NTT Docomo become a car company? Mm -hmm. 
Right. So this is where, and we, talk, you know, we go back to, you know, your list of really important companies in this concept, right? So Google's been rolling out fiber and, you know, internet access all over the place, but also, and we haven't talked about this at all, Facebook is always working on giving people more access to the internet in places where they haven't had it, right? Mm. And their reason for doing this is, again, not necessarily to be benevolent because they want all their friends to have internet access. It's because the more people they to whom they give access, the more people can be on Facebook. Yeah. And that changes that changes everything, right? Exactly. So oh, yes, I do think that big data matters quite a bit. Sorry, I interrupted you. Please. No, no. It's, uh, I think we're on on the 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 uh, the tip of big data, and, and these non auto manufacturer brands really have such a strong position. Not just having the access to the data, but they've got the the front end touch point with the consumers. You know, whether it's mm. that's Alexa in the home or Google Home or whatever. Plus, they have. A better, they're just better at understanding what customers want, right? They're just built from that perspective around customer needs as opposed to, you know, years and years of industrial legacy like a lot of the auto manufacturers. But I want to throw in here, I've got a stat here from a friend of mine, John Waraniak, who runs the SEMA show, which is the Special Equipment Manufacturers Association, which is like the, the whole... Uh, the auto after parts market. So it's where all the sort of customizations of cars happen. Right. And he said that performance vehicles account for 10% of sales yet generate 90% of the media coverage and they're critical to brand and technology leadership. So the, the worry here that right. established auto brands have is that they will lose the leadership. They will lose that mind share because they're not in that space at the same kind of level that these new players like Amazon and Google or Facebook, as you say, maybe, right? So that's the real worry for them. And it's interesting that when Google launched the, well, well when Google first profiled their their uh, autonomous car, they chose mm -hmm. to do it at the SEMA show in Nevada rather than going up to Detroit and doing it at the, the auto show, right? That's fascinating. So they understand, because you know, if they do it at the, the SEMA show, with all those kind of like equipment brands and audio brands and all these people who do all the sort of the after part customization, those, those are the partners that they need to build this stuff, right? They're just avoiding, they're bypassing Detroit and all the incumbent auto brands there. I just think it's an interesting dynamic for how this might play out. Right, I mean, I think you have to ask yourself, who do you trust more to automate something? Do you trust General Motors? Or do you trust Google, mm. right, or Apple, or, I mean, Samsung I don't trust so much only because some of their things catch on fire, <laughs> all, joking, all joking aside. No, I mean, That's it's real. fair, right, because a lot of these vehicles are going to be electric, and if they have batteries in them, maybe you don't. It's the same batteries <laughs> in the, the, yeah, the S7. Just a bigger version of the S7, right? But a company like Uber that's been working really closely, you know, with this stuff, you trust the fact, and even Tesla, right, because right. Tesla has – the halo effect of having Elon Musk there, and Elon Musk is, you know, the greatest inventor since Tesla himself, kind of right. thing, yeah. right? But who do you trust? And the real question is, the automobile itself has is slowly but surely becoming a commodity. And if that's the case, the thing that's not a commodity is the software that runs it, and the companies that have been producing software, like you say, and this, what is it, Semma? Semma? Yeah, SEMA. SEMA. SEMA, yeah. right? It's all the stuff that happens to the automobile after it turns into an automobile in whatever shape it is that's really going to drive yeah. sort of the trust. And you're right. If people – when people think about Porsche, they think about the 911 Turbo or when they think about you know, General Motors, they think about the Cadillac Escalade or whatever it's called, right? These, these sort of high aspirational cars. Most people don't drive those though. But once that disappears, what's left? Mm hmm Right. What was this? What was the stat you said? What percentage of the cars are? Ten percent of sales, are performance vehicles. So right, but ninety so percent of the big... media coverage. Right. So same thing. Right. As usual, everybody focuses on the new concept car or the new performance car. How fast can it go from zero to sixty? But most people are just driving like a Chevrolet Cruze or a Toyota Corolla. Um, so a really interesting point. Where do you think we'll be in twenty years' time? What I mean, are we gonna? be in a world where 
these guys, Amazon, Google, Facebook, are producing all these autonomous vehicles? Or would it be in partnership with these incumbent auto brands? Or are the auto brands still going to be doing it? What do you think 20 years from now? I know it's a very, very long way. But just to kind of draw you out onto the soil a little bit, what do you think? No, it's a great question, actually. And I was having a conversation on a similar topic today. So if you look at the news that comes out every day today about tech, right? It's Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Apple are going to dominate everything until, you know, the end of time, right? Right. Because they have all the resources, they have all the smartest people and all this other noise. And yet, if you go back to only 10 years or 15 years, you had the exact same stories being written about IBM, Cisco, Sun Microsystems, and of course, Microsoft, right? Nobody wanted to develop a new product or a new service because Microsoft was just going to roll in and either A, take you over, or B, run you over, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. I'm not 100% sure who is going to dominate that space in 20 years, but I'm very sure that it's probably not going to be one of the companies that exist today. It mm-hmm. could be a Chinese entity. It could come out of Africa. Remember, there's a whole, there's this whole, you know, we don't talk a lot about Africa because we really focus on Southeast Asia, but there's no driving history or driving culture in most of Africa. So, in the same way that they went right to micropayments, right to mobile phones, um, and right to, you know, not physical banks, but internet banks or sort of digital banks, they might just go to every automobile that gets sold there, maybe an autonomous vehicle, and maybe the companies there can figure out faster because the tech itself is. I wouldn't say off the shelf, but relatively commoditized. Yeah. And maybe they'll figure out how to do this better than everybody else. But I'm pretty sure it's not necessarily going to be Amazon or Google or Facebook or Snapchat. Like, what would Snap do? You get a car for five seconds and it disappears. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Self destructs. Do you know what I mean? Like, that would be bad. Um, so I'm just not sure that that's going to be what's going to happen. But I know for sure, um, I won't pick a number, but. You know, somewhere north of, I think, 50% of all vehicles that are going to be on the road are going to be autonomous, and we never even left the ground, right? So we talked right. a little bit about this last time, but we just talking about ground-based vehicles. I mean, the air-based, the air vehicles, the vehicles in the sky are yeah. also going to be autonomous as well, where you're literally going to be able to... I was sitting in traffic yesterday, and I was late for a meeting, and I, I said to um, my passenger, wouldn't it be great if we could just, like, lift off in one of these sort of rotor-based drones or some kind of drone like that, and he just, you know, you just typed in your coordinates. And I really mean like your GPS-style coordinates, right? Your latitude and your longitude, and it just took you there. Right. Well, right. maybe some good news for you, Michael. There was a conference this week in the U.S., uh, Speed News Aero Auto Conference, which the focus of which was all about the collaboration between aero and auto on autonomy. Wow. So it's happening. I mean, it may be sort of cutting edge stuff, but there you go. I don't think it's far away as we think, right? Yeah, I don't think so either. I don't think so at all, actually. Um, And I think most people would argue that it's not going to happen nearly as fast as you and I think it's going to happen, but I'm pretty confident that that's going to be something that's uh, right around the corner, really. If, uh, uh, particularly if you talk 20 years out, it's, I think we're done. So We're talking about now, just uh, in sort of summarizing, summarizing, if a startup came to you and it was in this space, is there any particular type of startup that would really excite you or interest you? Because, you know, there's a huge risk associated with this, that somebody creates something which has all this potential, but the regulation just doesn't let it happen, right? Is there any particular shape or form or startup in this space that would excite you? You want to have a conversation with them? What kind of things would you want to see knocking at your door? I would want to see something that's not based on the ground necessarily, and that can carry humans, and that's really safe. Hmm. I would love to see somebody do that because, you know, again, you have a heart attack and you're sitting in traffic, you're going to die. But if your grandmother has a problem and the vehicle can just literally show up at her house and then just whisk her off to a hospital or be the hospital and it's flying so it can get to wherever it needs to go really quickly, that to me will be amazing. And I don't see any reason why that can't happen, actually. And all the things that we've been discussing about ground-based vehicles can happen in the air as well. And to a certain extent, um, we do it already, right? In other words, what's the more luxurious way to travel? driving a, even a really fancy car 
because there are bumps on the road and no matter how good the shock absorbers are, there are still bumps. Like you're not drinking champagne when you're driving because it could mm-hmm. potentially spill all over you. But if you're in first class and you're in like a flatbed sleeper kind of cabin on the first class flight, that's the height of luxury. And I think that's going to continue to happen. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'd love to see. And I, I don't think it's too far away to be fair. Right. So some sort of large scale drone automated. Sure. I mean, imagine a four passenger drone where it's um, sleeper cars, you know, four flatbed sleepers. So you can, again, you can take a three hour flight from wherever you are in Yokohama to Okinawa. Mm. Yeah. Or if you're just too afraid to go over the ocean, but there's no reason why, even if that thing falls, it can't have like a raft associated with it. There's no reason why it can't have a, a parachute or some type of protective device on it, right? Right. Right. And the biggest problem is, you know, when you train a pilot today, they have to, it's either they use instruments or they can just do line of sight, right? But in this case, you may not need to know anything because the vehicle itself is just going to be so safe. I'd love to see that. Oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be amazing if that happens. Just the prospect, you could just go everywhere, right? Yeah, and again, you'll have to create lanes in the sky, right? Because there'll be a lot of those vehicles. But I, I do believe really strongly that, you know, if you can get to a place faster, you're going to need fewer vehicles as well. So it'll all be sort of Uber-esque or shared in some way, shape, or form because no one's going to want to own it and maintain it. That'll that'll go to like really large companies or, or large entities to do that for you. You'll lease it or you'll just borrow it whenever you need it because mm-hmm. it'll be so convenient, right? Like now... If you want to grab taxi or an Uber, it could take 20 minutes to get to where you are. But imagine if it just like showed up. <laughs> right. Because it's in the sky. It just pops onto the top of the building. You walk up to the top of the building. It takes you exactly where you want to go. You take an elevator down to the restaurant. You're done. Right. That's beautiful. That's what we want to see. If you're working on that at the moment, we want to hear from call, you. Call me. <laughs> yeah, it's the hotline. <laughs> call me. Don't yeah, text me. <laughs> Exactly. Here's the quarter. Dr- Don't pick my say, Drive over to my place. <laughs> let's go really retro. Well, look, let's do one more thing before we before we stop this conversation. Um, you know, one of my favorite companies falls into. I just cannot stop making really silly press releases that at some point no one's going to end up believing. So this is my like that's a big surprise type of thing. Oh, it's not who I think it is, is it? <laughs> surprise me! No, surprise me. First. No, what do you think it is? No, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to say it because then I feel like I'm, yeah. No, no, you, you go ahead. I don't want to steal your okay. thunder. So, you know, according to, and I'll loosely call it the press, right? Um, I just love the wording on this. I wish I could go through this word for word. But, you know, Thailand's leading fintech startup, which in and of itself is just completely wrong. Um, the headline of this article says, Omise joins hands with Alipay, right? Mm. Now, that, the, the presumption of that headline is that there's some sort of agreement between both of those companies. My guess is that Alipay has an API that's, public, that's available if you just sign a contract with them. Yeah. And as long as you write software against their API, you're now one of their partners. But, I mean, I think if my dead grandmother were writing software and understood the API, she could also write to this Alipay API. Well, I'm right. guessing, right? Cause I don't know. But I don't like the, the sort of disingenuity of this headline that says um, – you know, according to this statement, the partnership yeah, partnership aims to create a borderless online payment market for Asia, as well as bringing the gap between Chinese consumers and businesses in Thailand that this company called Omise serves. I just think, you know, it's not a big surprise that this company is going to come out and say that there's a partnership or that they're holding hands or grasping hands. What is it that they join hands with this? Because the reality is that none of that is true. And if you read through the entire article, most of it focuses on things like um, – you know, customers want to be able to buy things from China or Chinese consumers come to Thailand and want to be able to use Alipay. And then the other half of the article is just, you know, the company was founded in 2013 and that it got funded last year for $17.5 million. So wow. again, I don't think it's going to be a big surprise that this whole article is silliness, but also that it's a little bit disingenuous because is there, is no, there is no agreement. Right. There is no partnership you know, any I believe as long as they meet some sort of requirement, and there are probably requirements, but that any payment company, whether it's 2C2P or any of the other payment companies that we've discussed over time, could also write software with the approval. It's like it's not an agreement, right? That is funny. 
It's almost like right. uh, what the Omise developer intern successfully downloaded the software developer kit from <laughs> yeah, Alibaba. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and managed to write a few lines of code. Now we are joining forces with Alipay. Right. And, like, is it exclusive? Like, this is not news, and the fact that someone actually gets paid to write this to me is a little bit silly, but it's not a big surprise. We've had a few of those, haven't we? I mean, it's kind we of have. how that you, you sort of, you've got a keen eye for these. You're quite, you don't let them get through, do you? No, and I think it's important, right, that you have a voice, and this is, this gets loops all the way back to where we started this conversation um, earlier today, and that is, you know, people trust you if you have a view. And your view can be positive and negative, but it has to be real and it has to be based on facts. And yeah. the people are really kind of coming to us now and saying, what's your view on this? Because when I listen to you talk about things that I either agree with or don't agree with, you have a strong opinion and that opinion is based in fact. And that's really important to people, particularly in the global context of what's going on. Yeah. They want to have a source that's trusted and that's kind of what we are. So I don't mind doing it at all, both from a positive and from a negative. Yeah, this partic- yeah. this type of thing is particularly bothersome because, you know, this is a press release. It's not a news story. And even the press release itself is disingenuous. So it won't be a big surprise when the rest of the world figures it out and just figures it's silliness. Fair enough. Good. Glad you brought that up. How can people get in touch with us, Michael? So they can get in touch with us all over the Internet. They can look at us on asiatechpodcast.com. We're starting to see some very good traffic there. They can tweet to me. At Michael Waits, please hashtag Asia Tech Podcast. And, you know, they can email me at michael.waits at gmail.com. There are plenty of ways to get in touch with both of us. Uh, they can look at Facebook pages as well, Asia Tech Podcast there. And they can look on SoundCloud. We're all over the place. And please subscribe on iTunes, iTunes. subscribe on YouTube. Leave a review on us. iTunes, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please rate us because the ratings really matter. Yeah. Um, you know, we want to be the number one five-star podcast exactly. for tech in asia in southeast asia so and we're we're going there anyway and and the other thing as well is you'll see um an announcement hopefully coming in the next three weeks about a distribution deal where we're going to have a much larger distribution for us so we'll, we'll talk about that over the next few weeks as well right and it will be more than just holding hands with the distributor right we're actually gonna do yeah that. no this is where we're really <laughs> it's not like we've downloaded an api um this is real and it should give us access to many more people, not just locally, but globally. So that that's a big deal, and we're very happy about that. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.